welcome to Mindscapes, our series of conversations with men and women whose ideas, visions, philosophy and talents define contemporary India. My guest today is singularly acknowledged as a maestro, a virtuoso in the classical Indian traditions of music, as a solo violinist. But he's equally well known and has acquitted himself with grandeur, with credit and with aplomb and with universal applause in his role as a composer, as building bridges of sensibility between Indian classical music traditions and those of the West. I'm delighted to welcome Dr. L. Subramanian. Uh, I should add that the, the, the prefix of, of, of doctor uh, is really a, a, a medical doctor. Uh, do you use it often, or is it just something that's ascribed to you? Well, um, after finishing uh, medicine, I've not really practiced. But rarely, if I need anything, I don't have to go to a doctor. You, you were call. able to write your own I prescription? I just try and uh, get it. I call my friends and ask the prescription, I mean, ask the name and write it myself. Yeah. You know, there's a great deal of uh, uh, work being done in the West and, and, and music, music for, for healing, and yes, working right. with the mind. And, and if music be the food of love with Shakespeare, um, in, in what ways that, that, that do you think that, that, that music plays upon the mind and is able to influence and impact us? Basically, music is a stimulant. It's a vibr I mean, the vibration of sound uh, which is passed on to the brain and then there are different reactions to different things. So I, I'm interested in music therapy maybe at a later stage when I can spend more time. Right now I'm so running around playing and writing. It's what, a, what comes, um, uh, in a sense, uh, you know, what precedes what, the chicken and the egg? When, you, when, you, when you're working with music and, and, and you're looking to sort of capture, portray this, uh, this, this, this feeling, this rasa, this, this emotion, uh, what leads what? The, 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 the internalization of a feeling, of a mood uh, that expresses itself uh, in the music or, or, or the music sort of inducing that in turn within you? How does that sort of relationship work? In my case, normally when I start playing, basically, you probably, I mean, you just shut off yourself from the external thing, you just get into the sound and the the sound itself. And we, every sound, every note has certain vibration, certain quality to it. It's just a note when somebody thinks it's just a note. But there, there are so many things beyond that. So once we get absorbed in it, I mean, it comes to a point where you create a mood or you feel because of the intervals, whether it is a microtone or whether it's ornamentation, you feel something within you. And if you really truly feel that, and if you're able to uh, bring that uh, emotion through your own feeling and notes playing and communicate to a, a third person or the audience, in this case, who are sitting, at the end of the show or end of our lap, everybody feels like very calm and quiet or mystic then it's uh, usually it is created within yourself because of the sound then passed on externally. What is that, that relationship, that minuscule gap between uh, you know, that, that feeling and, and virtuosity uh, you know, when, when the fingers and, and, and the bow moves in just the right way because you're feeling just right? <laughs> yeah. the, uh, my father always has felt like there are two ways. I mean, if you are really uh, a master at the instrument, then you can play whatever you want to play. So suddenly in your mind you think of a phrase, and you, instead of using this finger, you might think, I want to use this finger, which is much more difficult in that particular contest. If you're free of technical inhibitions, you can just use that finger and get that emotion. But the same note when you played with this finger is different than when you played with other fingers. So. If you are not virtuosic or if you have limitation, technical limitation, you can play only what you can play. That itself limits your uh, creativity uh, in general role. So always, you know, it's a virtuosic thing. People think, you know, being a virtuoso is at time look differently. But it is, I think, basically if you want to be totally free of any inhibitions, to play whatever you want to play and express whatever you want to express, the technical inhibition has to be first ruled out. And to be virtuosic is an advantage, very big advantage. So when did, then when did you feel for yourself that, that this had happened to you and, and, and you were now liberated from, 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 from the mere technique of it? You grew up in a family which was music, but the music was sort of in your bones as it were. Uh, you started training initially to be a vocalist and then the violin happened to you. 
and with all kinds of sort of routes and by routes into the medical profession and, and what have you. Uh, but, but on this path, when did it really happen for you that you felt, ah, was there a eureka moment? It happened um, when I started playing with major orchestras. Till the time I was playing, I had techniques and uh, I was playing solo concerts. So, you no, know, it's like no, I was playing alone with my own percussion, I was traveling widely with other people. But when I started playing with the orchestras, uh, particularly when I was asked by Mr. Zubin Mehta to write a piece for New York Philharmonic, it was in the 80s. He told me, write uh, anything, a uh, strings player will play, I mean, they can play anything, write anything. So that put me in a spot. So I wanted to do something which uh, I have not, I never done before and also write something which is, uh, which a major orchestra has not done before. So I wrote a lot of difficult things at that time for the orchestra. This was based on the Vedas, right? Yeah, Fantasy on Vedic Chants, Fantasy on Vedic Chants. So I wrote an extremely difficult piece for orchestra and then we rehearsed everything. And also that put me all, all of a sudden, made me aware of my technical freedom. Because when the orchestra plays and I had to reply, here, you know, is a full, you know, 80 piece or 85 piece, full orchestra playing with full strength. Then I'm a single violinist sitting there with two percussionists and playing, answering to them. So it was like a whole huge uh, clusters of sound coming and then a single violin. Coming. So I had to create a lot of uh, things. So all of a sudden, when I was improvising, I realized, you know, I have to do something different. So whatever I was thinking, I was trying to do at the time. That made me realize, you know, well, this is so. From that time, it made me a lot of awareness of, I can just emotionally get into a state without any inhibition, just play what I feel like playing, without having but to. Isn't it amazing that this should happen uh, when you're in a context with an orchestra working essentially with scripted music? One would have imagined it would have happened when you were working with unscripted music and you weren't sort of limited by, by, by what was predictable and structured in that sense. Yeah, but the thing when you were not working with an orchestra, whatever you thought you played, you didn't realize it. You were trying to push your boundaries further. Because you became, uh, becomes very spiritual when you play an alap, become very emotional, very moody. You know, Indian music is like that. It has a very strong spiritual base. But when you work with a Western orchestra where everything's written, virtuosic things are written, then you are improvising against them. Well, my part was not written. I was still improvising. So all of a sudden I realized, oh, this sounded more than what I really have written because everybody's playing full. So I have to do something different. So whatever on this part you thought you have to do it, I did it at that time. And we had a tremendous response. Every, every concert we had an ovation for that too, right? I cannot forget that. But the whole thing was that made me aware, I mean, oh, this has been done already. So that from that time onward, I played with several orchestras in Moscow Symphony for the India Festival closing, diff different places. So I went with the mental freedom, I, whatever I want to play emotionally, spiritually, or technically, I should be able to play. And how is that different to sort of playing with, with jazz musicians? Jazz, that too? Uh, jazz is a Some different role. Yeah, it's a whole different feeling. People like Grappelli, for example, right. uh, he will, you have an album piece like Conversation, uh, wrote and gave, but then it was real conversation. I mean, he was starting to put different paintings and different colors to the same melody while he was improvising. It's a totally different statement of the same thing. And also he had so much of freedom and easiness in the style he was playing. He was not like a Western stiff train musician who just stands very stiff and play. He was very relaxed and uh, picked up the violin. It was almost like part of his arm and things. So for a mid 80 year old person to feel absolutely you know, like everything is, you know, violin is part of him, the bow is part of him. It was an amazing experience. It was a whole different experience. Yet the, 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 you know, the violin isn't really a classical Indian uh, instrument, is it? Not anymore. <laughs> so it has become very, very important primary solo instrument in our tradition. But originally, we had, we believe we had something from Ravana's time, something like string board instrument. Even in China, they have the Serhu, two string instrument. Other countries, they have. So we also had something. I believe during trade, it went and got modified, and we adapted the present form when the Britishers came. But I have modified it further. I have sympathetic violin. I also have different suffice. What ways have you modified the violin? 
I've had added early 70s, I had violins made with uh, different sympathetic strings underneath, basically to use like a tala string in veena. You know, in veena they have a tala string where as they are playing, they indicate the tala with the little finger. So I st developed uh, certain techniques, so while playing, also plucking, also having under the main bridge sympathetic strings, and also on the side bodies. And then it became a hassle because I was almost in a month I was playing 25 concerts, so anything goes wrong, changing the string took me like half an hour. So then I went to five string violin, six strings violin, which I used now, which was made and given to me by major companies. Recently, Yamaha gave me a uh, violin called Silent Violin. It is called Silent Violin. I was in Japan two weeks back, so they were kind enough to give me a violin, which I can play with the headphone in all the, any room, any hotel. It doesn't bother anybody. Absolutely silent. At the same time, if you connect it to the amplifier, you can blow the whole theater noise like that. How long does it take you to, to develop this, this, this intimate, uh, intuitive relationship with the instrument that you're playing? Can you just pick up the violin and play? I mean, assuming it's, it's, it's well tuned and... It's well, I've been born and brought up uh, with the violin. I uh, started very early, thanks to my parents. My father was a violinist, mother was a singer, so th not even a single day passed by without me either playing or listening to music. Either I have to play alone, practice, or listen to my father playing, or my sister singing, or brothers playing, or my mother singing. It all became part and parcel of So when you grow up like that, you know, automatically, it's, you know, without it, I cannot imagine, imagine my life without... But are you attached to, to particular violins, to particular uh, instruments, and, and you will only play that and nothing else? Not really. Um, most of the concerts I play in one of the violins, which was given to me by Barkasbury in 1985. That too before I played Fantasy on Vedic Chant. That had a lot of significance because that was the piece I wrote for my mother, who at that time just passed away. This was written for her. It was a very, very strong emotional time. And I was just getting back to playing because of my wife and father saying, oh, go back, you know, no, nothing, you better stop playing, you know, what can you do, you know, you will be just doing opposite of what they wanted you to do. I just got back. At the time, this Barkersbury came and said, there are two violins we have specially made uh, with the gold plate and things like that. We want you to play. So I started playing with that. I almost restarted my career after stopping for a short time. And from that time, I played thousands of concerts in the violin all over the world. With you went through a sort of a, a, a similar, uh, uh, well, there I call it crisis in, in, in creativity and, and, and expression when you when you lost your wife. Yes. Uh, uh, what has it taken to, to come back and, and bounce back with such vigor? Um, in many, I mean, there are two deaths which happened before my wife died. One was my mother's death, which was the first major uh, setback in my life, shock, whatever depression. And I was pulled out by Viji once again. She's saying, why don't you write a piece in her honor? your wife. Yeah, she was my wife. And uh, she said, why don't you do it? Then later on, my father died in 1990. And he was also my guru and teacher. And I was very, very close to him. So then also I put down my instrument for a while. I could not touch it and play and write anything. And she sort of uh, pushed me into it. He said, uh, like, you know, this was their dream, because they had all these dreams. My father's dream was to make the violin known internationally, Indian violin. He said, you were able to do it, you brought his dream back, and uh, you, because he used to tell me, go and listen to many men, go and listen to Grappelli Orchestra, so you know how you can change the whole thing. And these are the people I collaborated, these were the people, they wrote letters to me, they wanted to collaborate, we recorded, we played, uh, we were, became friends, you know. Seeing all these things, my father was very happy. So she said, all of a sudden, after all these things, if you start playing, this is just opposite of what your parents want you to do. Why don't you write a special piece for him? I wrote a piece called Beyond, which will be believe in reincarnation. So we did an orchestral tour with Swiss Romand Orchestra. So that, so it was almost second time she pulled me out of the whole thing. Then when she became sick and after after she died, I practically stopped for a while. I didn't play. I didn't. You spent a long time looking after her yeah, when you were off music. Please. Yes, she was uh, pretty sick at the later part of her life. So after a while, uh, one of the one of my friends, he came from Chicago, New York. They were doing the 50th year celebration in New York for the United Nations. So he came to me and said, 
we have requests from our former president and all those things. You have to do the closing piece. You have to do a special piece for the UN. I said, I have not even touched my violin. I have not played for a while. I, can, I cannot write. He said, why don't you write the piece for your wife? We will dedicate the whole show for her. That's how I started the Global Symphony. What ways do you feel that sort of coming to terms with these three deaths has, has impacted uh, your, your work, made it uh, more intense and in, in, in what ways? Yeah, I heard some of my recording which was done much later after Vijay died and some of the playing I have done the same rag as earlier. There's a world of difference, a world of difference because I cannot explain, I, mean, I have the same technique, I have the same violin, I have the same player. But the approach, the emotion, the feeling, you almost like go much, much deeper. And I think artist, the suffering is part of artist life. I think in order to be a, most of the great artists like Beethoven, Mozart, everybody, Bach, uh, some of the greatest artists who, who we listen to today, they have all gone through similar or even uh, things which probably worse. I mean, in my case, I think mine is the worst. Who knows, you know, there must be other people who must be having similar circumstances. This is one thing, I went through a lot of other problems which very, very close people completely, you know, unexpectedly I got into. They just, uh, when you start believing and just do things, you get trapped into a lot, lot of situations. So all these things made me aware of in a different aspect of life, different aspect of music, different depth to the music. With some of this sort of, uh, uh, you know, the sort of our, our, our tradition of, of of, of superstition and, and, and the mystical, and there is something mystical about music. Does that does that sort of create a proclivity to sort of an interest in other aspects of the mystical? Mysticism, I mean, always I've gone to some of the saints who had the powers of creating things. I, when I was asked to play for, I mean, I went to Sati Sai Baba, he asked me to perform for, I was, uh, somebody arranged a concert to play there and he created a ring which was fascinating to me to see and subsequently he created quite a few things in front of me because before that I've read, I've been told but when you really see uh, like that I also, another saint, uh, Kanapati Satchidananda Swami so I met him uh, when Viji was sick, we went there and I also have taken my children at that time so we have taken some, you know, we have taken gall and fruits or something he picked up the garland, and the garland which I picked up in the Mysore in the street, you know. He took one uh, one of the jasmine and gave back, it became a ring. So he kept on giving to my children, they got shocked. They said, oh, this is a magic Swami, you want to see. So it's like, you know, all the mysticism, they do have certain power. They do. So many times, I even go to Sangracharya and Madras, Kanji Gamba uh, These saints, you know, they have something which uh, probably some of them have totally renounced their life. They are not attached to anything. So their way of looking at lives and looking at death, looking at birth is probably different than what as a human being, as you know, we, or I might be doing it. So many times I just go and I, these are the saints that are responsible for me playing also because they, I practically stopped playing from Baba to Sankracharya, uh, Bala Parival to Anabadi Satchidananda Swami. All the saints have said, don't stop playing. Do you, do you find that, that music in some ways helps you cultivate the sense of, of surrender, of, of detachment? Uh, because in some ways, uh, the, in, in, in performance, it's a, it's, it's a control, decontrol. You have to let go and yet be in control. Yes. In a way, when you really start playing, in a way you forget the whole thing. So absolutely you get detached to and you are not aware of anything, you are not attached to anything except the sound capsule in which you are completely covered with. So you hear only the sound, you think only the sound. You Many times I insist on switching off all the audience lights so that there is no external, you know, stimuli or anything. I just want to get to the sound. So once you keep doing it, you know, you forget yourself, you get, at least at that time, you don't want anything. You are in a different state of mind where you are almost like you are fulfilled, you know. I'm sure you know what I mean. You don't need anything. You are you are there, and everything you need is there. That's all you want. Is there a difference then before in in, in performing uh, before an audience, even though you should put the lights out and, and try and, and, and imagine they're not there, and just playing for yourself? Is there a different kind of tension, magic? When you start playing, you are aware you are in a particular place, uh, Delhi or New York, wherever it is. 
But as you start playing, after a while, when you get to a point, you completely forget where you are. Then, then when you're totally finishing and come going opening, then you realize you're you're aware of things. You know there are certain formalities you have to finish in a certain way. All those things you have to stop. All those things. But other than that, when you whether you are playing in your own house or whether you are playing for a ten thousand audience, starting and ending, you are aware. But when you really get into the sound capsule, go into it. It is the same. When you're when you when you're recording and you know you have to do a recording in 45, 52, or whatever minutes the the cassette or the CD is going to, how do you cue yourself? Does someone tell you, look, you have five minutes left? Sometimes in the recording theater they put the light, but late. What I have been doing basically, I just go and record once. We time it. If there's something short, we fill it up. If something long, we'll say we we'll try to edit it or keep it a longer CD. When nowadays, you know, CD could be 50 to 74 minutes. So fortunately, before at least you know LPs were 20 minutes, so you cannot play 25 minutes. So it has to be 20, 22 minutes. But now that 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 has been a great help to see anything. But as you say, you know, many times earlier in the radio broadcast or something, they'll say all the time five minutes, four minutes, three minutes. They used to show that itself, you know, especially in national program. But I, I've stopped playing in the radio for many reasons because of the all the political reasons. Because they, for a long time, you know, they are I have practically violin, to bring the violin to this level, I've done so much. But till today, uh, the top grading, they are not given to me in AR. My goodness. Till today. And people who have started playing uh, 10 years later, they're all got in. It's a, I mean, I know it's a political thing, and I don't want to ask anyone. National outrages, really. So, uh, <laughs> I stopped playing for the, when I used to play for radio, this is the thing, you know. Uh, I mean, naturally, they had some time limit, it's, you know, they have to show time. That used to be a distraction, four minutes, two minutes. So in the middle of uh, improvisation or anything, then you have to be aware that you... you feel sort of hurt that India's national uh, radio network uh, should, should treat you so, and, and you have done so much for, 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 for the, for the vi Indian violin, and you have, been, you have remained so firmly rooted uh, in the Indian classical tradition, despite working with, with all these wonderful people. You know, you have the Menuhin, uh, uh, Zubin Mehta, and, 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 and uh, vast range of celebrities from, from the Western musical traditions. In a way, I'm disappointed, frankly. This is uh, one part of it. Another part of it was like in Madras, where I was born and brought up, there's a composer's list. And if anybody wants to play a composition of mine, I'm not in the comp approved composer's list. Here I am. My composition has been played all over the world by all the major orchestras. I mean, it has been broadcast all over the world. You know, when we did the Global Symphony with the Berlin Opera, uh, 28 nations broadcast simultaneously. Millions of people heard it. That was entirely my comp two hours of my music. Here in Madras, uh, they have not put me as a proved composer. And this is irony. <laughs> is, uh, what can you do? But I don't have the time for radio. I've been so busy giving concert and uh, they broadcast on the television, whatever it is. But that's what it is. You know, <laughs> whom to blame, whom not to blame. I don't want to go into it. But it is strange, you know, when uh, somebody, I believe, went to play my composition, my niece, they said, oh, no, he's not approved composer. He cannot uh, play his composition. Uh, <laughs> so. <laughs> Uh, you know, you, you have you have stayed rooted in the in the Indian classical traditions. Is there something sacred about the classical, and, and what makes a tradition classical? Just because it's old? Yeah, there are two things. One is uh, the tradition itself. The whole uh, hardcore music of the tradition is composed by saintly composers in our tradition, South Indian. Basically, is you know, Purandara Dasa, Tyagaraja, Dichitar, Shama Sastri. These are the uh, compositions which these saintly people created, which has been passed on by oral tradition, even though I don't believe in uh, uh, people saying it has been maintained as it is. Because if a disciple is able to listen to his teacher and exactly sing the same thing, he will be another guru. Why should he go to the teacher? So there must be some percentage we must have lost at each or added. Because there are people who are innovative. And Innovations have kept the art growing. Innovations have kept the classes from growing, flowing. Otherwise, if somebody does the same thing which was done two decades ago or three decades ago, nobody's going to listen to it. So there have been constant growth, but the whole structure is uh, the spiritual current, undercurrent of the composition. The stories and the songs, the lyrics are based on mythological stories. 
It's a very, very strong... Uh, yet when you went out in, in, into the 60s with the violin, they just thought that this is third world music, which is sort of folksy. Yeah. But the, we cannot separate the, uh, the spiritual base from our classical music. Then, and also the fact that it has come for centuries together, plus every decade somebody have come along, every century somebody have come along, expanded and created a new dimension to it, has made it grow and grow. So what, 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 what remains uh, for you? You've reached the stage of, of being uh, uh, of technical excellence, of being able to, to surrender to this bubble of sound and encase yourself in it. You're working with the, with the best uh, musicians around the world, uh, even though you're not on the AIR recruit list, you're an approved <laughs> composer in Madras. <laughs> no, I'm not even the A-top. You're not even giving me the A-top of playing. No. <laughs> so what, what remains for you? You know, my dream has been to create an institution in my father's name. That when my father died, the first thing Vijay did was she created a, a festival, Lakshminarana Global Music Festival. We do it every year. And we last festival also we brought many in. A lot of international artists have come. So we do every year international festival which was started by Vijay in his honor. Then after she died, we registered a foundation called Vijay Global Arts and Vijay Records, which, um, which will be releasing a lot of the things. So we were also planning to create a center, international center, where we can coach some of the Indian artists or some of the Indian ta most talented people, select them, give them total, you know, encouragement and backup and financial assistance and coach them. That is my, one of my major but ambitions. When does, the, when does the musician retire from, from playing music? In classical music, normally, you know, once you cannot play, you start conducting or you start uh, coaching or you start teaching. Because uh, in other forms, other uh, areas, people do retire in ballet and things like that. When it comes to classical, you know, always, uh, like many when he stopped playing a little before he died then, but he was still conducting till the end, because conducting is a different thing. But in my case, as a composer, you know, if, as long as mentally I'm sane, um, I can write music, whatever is your impression, whatever you're feeling, you can express. And I hope I can play. I, sh I want to be around till I can play, frankly, because I cannot imagine my life without playing. So if, I would rather you know, play in a full form and end my life than um, be in a situation where I cannot play and just write music or just coach. Well, all strength, all power to you, and we will be applauding all the way. Thank you very much. Awesome. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks.